two, 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 and a mic. Karin, it's always, always a pleasure. I'm so happy that we've managed to slip so, you know, naturally back into our rhythm of uh, meeting on a regular basis. Yeah, how are you, first of all? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm trying to get better. But uh, these discussions with you really keep me um, on my toes and <laughs> keep my brain sane, I must say. Okay. Um, right. No, it's wonderful to talk to you. And uh, the nicest thing is we have conversations now with both where the, the input is mutual and we can relate to one another on that level. And that is something I really dearly respect and uh, appreciate. Yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful for me. Um, and I, I know that, for example, my mum absolutely loves listening to uh, my podcasts, um, especially though with you. Um, she she thinks, uh, and she's absolutely correct in doing so, that you are a fascinating person. Um, and she loves the way that you express yourself. Um, and there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of interest um, in your your opinion, uh, your your experiences, and just the stories that you tell. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that as well. Please give your uh, give my best to your mom, and uh, say how much I appreciate her son. <laughs> you just did so, so I hope that makes her happy. So, thank you very much, Karin. Um, yeah, so today. All right. Was a wonderful. You threw a fantastic curveball, as in, okay, so you you lived in the states, so I'm sure you are familiar with the baseball jargon. Absolutely, jargons. yes. Yeah. Um, so I had been expecting to talk about another one of these wonderful uh, 19th century books. However, you you came up with a yeah, uh, slightly alternative suggestion, which is brilliant because it's something that we both have um, experienced in you to a great degree um, and and me to a, a lesser degree. Um, but That's not I'm... true. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, I, I was the one who left translation and went into uh, academia uh, and only got back into translating later. Yeah. So I'm the one who, who was uh, untrue to translation. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that the the industry is is absolutely happy that you're back, and I don't think it'd be complaining too much about your temporary betrayal. Um, but yeah, that's the way it is. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's what is one of one of the things that I'm, I I really appreciate the most is how you you know you take a topic and you uh, intellectualize it, and 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 this comes from the basis of the way in which you think it's your the analytical element um right. and and yeah right. do you want to just talk about that your your process and how you approach things um you're absolutely right i uh analyze um and then try to sensitize into a full picture but analyzing is uh something that kept me from writing uh fiction i can write poetry i cannot write fiction because that is a creative synthesis and not you, you shouldn't analyze while you're writing. And I always, whatever I do when I write, I analyze while I'm writing. And this is why this is, is uh, uh, very, very difficult for me. I can write uh, essays and uh, analytical stuff and um, yes, no problem, but when it comes to uh, prose, uh, it's very hard. Uh, poetry sometimes happens. It hasn't happened in the last two years, I must say. There was a time when I was writing more poetry um, and then it, it dried out. So yes, you're absolutely right. I'm an analytical head. 
<laughs> and um, this is why uh, I love to read, because that is enjoyment. That's uh, create creative or the participation in creativity, and at the same time, uh, analysis. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I you took it in, in um, yeah, in truly Calvin fashion. I actually meant it as a compliment. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that's how you it's interpret a it. Yeah, this was just a clarification. Uh, that's the way I am, uh, and I couldn't change it. I must say, <laughs> no. Um, I'm I'm very uh, grateful to be able to think analytically. Mm. I must say, so there's no worry. Mm. Okay, um, so our, our main topic of the day today then is going to be translation, but obviously from a number of different perspectives. And um, so you started very early on in your career translating. This is while you were still in Germany, wasn't it? And it was after that that you you went to the USA and you you, you studied Germanistics. Um, and um, but you also did some, if I'm not mistaken, some translation of German technical material in in at university didn't you um at um, at heidelberg uh, my first uh, full course of study was translation in germany at the university of heidelberg for seven semesters and in between i escaped for a year to america um and um so i'm i'm a diploma translator but of with a minor in politics rather than or political science rather than uh, economics. That's those were the two choices we had, meaning factual translation, translation from newspapers into a different language. So basically, um, that's where where you need analysis, where you need also uh, quite a bit of understanding of both languages you're dealing with. And I was lucky that I had spent four months at an English high school when I was 17. And then uh, in between those uh, years of study, I was in the States for a year. So I had both sides. I had the active learning of English and I had the exposure to English and or American culture and um, participation in life. And that was very, very good. And, and this was uh, uh, Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, no, please. And um, after that, I was a translator for a uh, credit information agency in Neuss uh, for three years, uh, which was um, not necessarily what I would have wanted to do for the rest of my life. Uh, it was the same thing all over again. And I was lucky uh, because of uh, having had Latin and French, I could uh, understand a bit of, of uh, Italian and because of uh, having had Spanish as a minor, I could translate from, from the Portuguese if necessary. Um, so I, I was dabbling in all kinds of languages, but it was the same content all the time. And this was what was so boring. Mm. But I mean, I wanted to ask as well, because, um, OK, we've already established that you were you have an analytical mind. Uh, in, in many ways, people are simply wired that way, isn't it? You know, they see a body of text and they look at it in a certain way because that's their natural inclination. Uh, as Was there at some point perhaps uh, a, a process which taught you analytical thinking? Is there, would you be able to attribute any particular uh, discipline? A lot of somewhere? aspects, a lot of aspects. Um, and I can't follow all of them, but uh, first of all, uh, when I was at Rice University in Houston, um, our uh, college master asked me to translate a biology paper, which he had written, no, which he wanted to read from, from a German colleague. And I translated it for him. And I was fairly happy with the translation because uh, 
I understood what uh, the paper was about. I understood the, the inferences. What I didn't know at the time, at least not that closely, was that there, are, there is language in language. So I translated it, I gave it to him, and he started laughing. He had tears in his eyes. He said, I understand every word you wrote, you translated, but that's not the way we would write a paper yeah. on biology. We have a different language for that. So I was very much aware that you had to analyze the language before you got into translating. That was the first, it, it was not a disaster. I laughed uh, in the end as well, because I couldn't have known. But from that time on, I went at, uh, into every text from the point of um, what is the text trying to tell me? How is it trying to tell that to me? Um, what language does the author use? Is it a special language? Is it, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, scientific language, uh, biological science language? Is it mathematical, mathematical science language? Is it literary science language, which is different from literature? Uh, so we have a lot of different analyses to go through before we really get into a text. And this is what uh, gave me the beginning, what was part of the beginning of my analytical approach. Because um, factual and fictional texts need uh, full attention. They need to be transmitted in terms of content, form, um, uh, language, intention, and cultural background. That's only four things of the many things that we have to consider. Um, while I was in England later in the, in the 80s, um, they asked me to give a lecture on translating. And that was reprinted uh, in uh, London and reprinted in uh, South Africa. And a little later, I will read just one chapter, uh, one, one part of it, one paragraph of it, because it cap encapsulates what I mean in terms of uh, the demands of translation. And this is what I've been talking about. It's just the type of translation that you and I did that, uh, that you are still doing and I did in the beginning, meaning mm. factual uh, information that we want to transfer into another language, into th the understanding of a different culture. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of the principles that you refer to there, I first experienced in law. So when I studied taught law, um, th this is a part of the process where judges who have to obviously judge a case and they look at uh, acts of parliament as their guidance. And the, the schools of thought are, do I interpret this act literally as in verbatim for what it has written there? Or do I look at the, um, the spirit of the act, which you right. refer, you consider as being, or you mention as intent? So what did they want to achieve with these words? And, and, and you don't always reach the same conclusion. And, and when you have this, so you know, at such, uh, I guess, a high level with regards to the, the language used, um, but also we talk about people who are, uh, specifically trained in a certain area, and they still interpret the same words differently. Yes. When it comes to translation, there are no limits to the interpretation because you have the text and you have the subject. Exactly. And, yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? It is difficult. Um, we had uh, at Heidelberg uh, Interpreter School, we had the uh, saying, stay as close to the text as possible and go away from it as far as necessary. 
you know, the, the balancing act of um, use your interpretation and then use the language you're translating into as the vehicle of portraying the same picture that came from the original. So it's basically, you know, language is, is a vehicle of communication, even between uh, two people of the, uh, speaking the same language. It's more difficult between two people speaking two languages. And there the transfer, it's a transfer. Uh, translation is not a one-to-one. -one. I had, um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, I had a very strange uh, experience. Uh, I translated for a uh, Nigerian anthology. I translated a poem by uh, Ken Sarowiwa, who had been killed uh, by the Nigerian government. And we were uh, really celebrating his life. And he had written a poem that started with two, uh, I only uh, read two sentences, and it was, corpses have grown and cover the land. And a friend of mine had translated it, unbeknownst to me, I had translated it and spent about oh, two weeks on it. And when we met, I said, you know, um, I'm sorry, I didn't know that you did did a prose translation. I would have contacted you um, if that, uh, just to tell you that I was doing another translation. And she said, oh, I, I did a, I did a poetry, I did a lyrical translation. And she, she had translated this into, um, there are more and more, as a, a retranslation into English, there are more and more corpses and they, the whole land is covered by them in, in those non-lyrical mm -hmm. sentences. And it was very easy to translate it into German by saying, gewachsen sind Leichen und bedecken das Land. Yeah. Corpses have grown. It's, it's almost a literary translation of what yeah. uh, Kensawa Weaver had written. And sometimes that's possible. Sometimes it is not. Uh, I only think of, of uh, uh, Dylan Thomas uh, and his Under the Milkwood. You couldn't translate that word by word. How would you? It would be in, in ev any different language. It would be garble. So uh, I... Uh, draw my hat to anybody who tried to translate that. And uh, there were there are quite a number of people who have translated it. And I particularly, although there is criticism, I like the translation by Erich Fried, but he is a poet. And to translate poetry, it really helps if you're a poet yourself or mm. if you have write, written poetry. But that was one of the examples of where Staying close to the text is better because it really catches what also the language that he used. And while a translation into into German uh, with with uh, side effects, it doesn't work. It is unpoetic. It's not lyrical. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I when I when I first had to do an, an official translation, I was 16 or 15 or 16. I had to do a, it was a test, in, an Armenian test, um, but by the British uh, Examination Board. So it was a, a test of Armenian, but for non-native Armenians. Uh, but it was the only official test that we the, as, a, as a school we could do in London. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I went into this test and everybody was saying, oh, you're going to you're going to be amazing because your Armenian is so good. And uh, I think I came something like 10th out of however many people there were. And uh, the problem was that the test, because it's written for non-native speaking Armenians, they don't actually expect 
um, any of the people taking the exam to know the real alternative Armenian version of, for example, an English proverb. Yes. So what so what they wanted the the participants to do um, was to just translate the, the words word for word, staying completely as in no deviation whatsoever from the actual words. And so, but what I did, I just went in there and I said, okay, well, you don't say this. You would never say this in Armenia. There's no such Armenian proverb of this form. So I put the Armenian proverb in its place. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I was punished for it because they said, but that's not written in the text. Where is it in the text? Um, so, you know, sometimes, as you say, you know, do not deviate, stay true to the original um, is perhaps the safest policy, if not always... Uh, what they want? Um, well, I, I think your your teachers were absolutely wrong because the best translation is the one that uh, comes to the listener or to the reader in their own language the way they are used to. And this is the hard part for for a translator who comes from a different. Uh, cultural and linguistic background. Um, if I uh, translate, uh, for instance, um, a piece of, of writing by uh, Heinrich Böll or by whoever, uh, and it does not approach the reader with the same tone, with the same a vowel or consonant um, intensity, n not the same, um, not not the um, imitation of, but same uh, strength of uh, tonality and, uh, if possible, uh, a rhythm that the reader can breathe. I think to write or translate into another language, you have to know how the, in the other language, the reader or the writer breathes. I think breath is a, an underground um, guidance of what should come to the other, uh, to the other party. I think that's a fascinating point, not only for translators, but for writers themselves. You know, as in, how do you want to pace your story? Because yes. quite often I've I've read a book and it's been given rave reviews, fantastic story. But I myself have not been able to get into it because the pace just isn't right. It just mm -hmm. doesn't suit me. Um, and, you know, whatever I tried, I just couldn't. You know, navigate the the rhythm in any way. Yes. Um, so I, I completely understand that. Um, it, it it is a challenge. Uh, there are books that I look into, and when I feel, as you just explained, um, not able to get into it, I try to translate one small paragraph, and if I can't translate it in any way, shape or form, I drop the book. It's not for me. Hmm. It doesn't have my breath or I cannot get into the breath of the book. Hmm. Uh, there's a, the first line of a poem by Rilke, um, for instance, says, um, Atem, du unsichtbares Gedicht, breathing, you are invisible poem. The connection between poem and breathing, for instance, which mm. is also true for for any other text, you have to be able to breathe the text. Um, also in translation, um, it's not it 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 doesn't help if if it's um, like a shotgun. I, it sounds like a shotgun, but in the original, it was like a breeze, mm. or it looks uh, or it's it's the uh, it's the uh, wonderful sunset in the original and you let the sun blast that's impossible that that's wrong 
And this is what I mean. You have to catch the tone. You have mm. to work on it. And some people say, you know, oh, I translated uh, 500 pages and I do that in, in two months. If they do, I wonder what the translation looks like. Sometimes with poetry, I spend two, three, four weeks for one poem before I give it out of my hand. Yeah, which is the most uh, financially re rewarding approach when you're paid on a word by word basis, for example. But, of course, uh, of course. Yeah, but that's the pride, I guess, you take in your work. Um, well, I was I was lucky. I never, I very uh, rarely translated uh, for money. I usually did it uh, within my other uh, privileged uh jobs as teacher or as um, working for for uh, displaced and uh, ex exiled writers and so on, mm. and to give them a, a voice in another language, I would translate some of their poetry. So um, I did a lot of African po uh, Nigerian poetry translations. Um, not just for the book uh, Und auf den Straßen eine Pest by uh, your mother-in-law, mm -hmm. your mother-in-law's publishing house. Um, I did uh, a lot of other translations uh, from African English, which is different from uh, British English or in American English and even British English and American e English need different kinds of translation because they breathe differently. They have different um, emphases and different images anyway. So um, to me, translate translating is wonderful because you can really get into it. You you have to you have to you have to take it seriously, particularly with poetry. And uh, with poetry, you get into worse problems, because what do you do if uh, there's a poem, like in one of the anthologies I did for, an, um, for a Nigerian writer, uh, his one of his favorite poems, of all things, was a poem um, which had uh, half rhymes. And in Nigerian poetry, there are lots of poems that have half rhymes. And half rhyme in German is wrong. You cannot, they, everybody will, you know, throw up their hands and say, this is not a rhyme. A rhyme has to be a rhyme. Mm -hmm. And they will say, whatever this sounds like is like a uh, carnival. Uh, carnival uh, Büttenrede, mm. a, um, a jocular kind of uh, rhymed, half rhymed, uh, non rhymed uh, uh, satire. And here it was in honor of one of the big, big Nigerian po poets. And I fought with him. He want he wanted he wanted the half rhymes, and I refused. I I tried in the end, wherever I could to rhyme it rather than half rhyme it. Mm. I mean, I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think Samuel Taylor Coleridge also used these half rhymes um, with some of the, the yes. yeah. And I mean that must I mean it must be so difficult then to translate this kind of you know poem uh, into German if they. They just refuse to accept the, the the relevance of half rhymes. It's because I guess it, it would completely, you know, I suppose, it would desecrate your your work if uh, if it's just looked at critically. Say, so, yeah, half rhymes. I ground my teeth. It. I still ground my teeth. Yes, <laughs> I still grind my teeth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I mean, so many things come up from the you know the topic of translation because people look at translation and say, okay, yeah, it's translation. There's no creativity. In it. Mm -hmm. You take one piece of work and you 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 just put it out into into your you know whatever language it is, and uh, that's it. And I mean that is so far from the truth because I've 
Um, you know, I have a, a, one of my favorite stories, um, the, the, the Wheel of Time, which is a science fiction and fantasy uh, series. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, the original was written in, in English. I've read it in Italian um, extremely happily, really having enjoyed uh, the book. Um, but yeah, Elena can't read it in German. Mm -hmm. uh, for her, it's impossible. She she tried and tried and tried. She just can't get into it. And I mean, I don't want to be critical of the translator, but um, yeah, th that obviously influences the potential success of a book of if course. the translation isn't quite what people have come to expect. Yeah, or what what they can um, what their ears can take and their breathe. You know. If they can breathe it, that's that's. I come back to that mm. image of of breath. Uh, if they can, if they read it and it goes against their breathing, that's it. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I I also remember being uh, asked. I was given a text, a scientific text, uh, written by uh, an American uh, scientist. It was a very long essay. Um, and I was asked to translate it, um, and okay, I did so, not, not alone, of course, with a native German speaker, that was Lena. Um, and, but the original document was written in what was, to me, a very old-fashioned type of English. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, we translated it in that way because we wanted to be true to the representation of the, of the original essayist. Yes. Um, and we delivered it, and the, we, the response was, what is this? <laughs> mm -hmm. This isn't the scientific material that we're used to pr uh, printing. Yes. Um, and so you know, my initial response was, well, this is what you gave us in English, so therefore this is what we translated. However, yes. if you don't want this, and, or if you want it to be translated in, your, in a certain standard way, then you have to tell us that that's what you want. Otherwise, you know, why would I not? You know? mm -hmm. um, I mean, have you, do you, for example, when you are asked to translate, and you, you sort of you know, refer to this when you, with your conversation with the, the Nigerian poet, but I mean, when people ask you to translate things, do they, do they also make other kinds of requests? Can, can you make it more literary? Can you make it more? Not really. No? Not really. Um, I get the response once it's done. Um, I did translate a play by my ex-husband and I translated it into American English which was at the time still very much closer to me than British English I had just uh, arrived in England and we had sent it to a uh, exile writer living in California no yes living in California and he had read the German version and then he had read the, my American version and he said, the American version, I understand. I don't understand the German version. <laughs> uh, it's much closer to my heart and to mm -hmm. my language. Um, this translation went to a British um, publishing house and it, we got it back saying, this is not English. <laughs> Who did that? Did the writer do that himself? <laughs> it was, it was obviously American English, but you know, it had the O, the O's in favor instead mm. of O U, and the oh, oh, it was so visible that it was American English, and uh, the imagery was was American English. Uh, the English publisher uh, thought it 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 was nothing. And if I hadn't had the response from from uh, the American side, uh, I would have really despaired because I thought I had really worked on it and I had loved working on it. And uh, so this this happens, and this is when uh, you realize you have to, in a way, one should ask the person you're translating for if it's a publishing house they usually have rules um if it's a one if it's one person they may have preferences but sometimes that goes uh, crisscross 
uh, I was translating a German book into English. And the publisher accepted it. And all of a sudden, the author, who an exile in Sweden, said, oh, this is not English. Uh, I had uh, my English friends uh, look at it, and it's not English. The English friends were German exiles. And um, they hung their criticism on one piece of translation, which was um, the term faculty. Fakultät in German is the whole shabam. It's the, 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 law, uh, the law school's faculty. The law school is the faculty. Not the law school's teachers are the faculty, but the law school is the faculty. Uh, so there's a totally different um, association with fakultät or faculty. And they didn't know that. And I, I mean, I, I used the uh, faculty in terms of uh, uh, teachers. You know, to belong to a faculty means you're a teacher for, for a particular department. And they were thinking of the departments. Um, so, you know, you have criticism from all sides and you have to defend yourself all the time. And it's very difficult to explain at any one point, and most of the times you don't have the time to trans to uh, explain why you did what and why you translated what. I did a uh, an essay that uh, Günther Grass uh, wrote, and uh, his 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 paper he he held in Moscow at an international pen conference. I don't remember which um, image or which saying it was, but in his um, in his paper there was a saying in German that does not have an equivalent in English. So he said, "Why didn't you Why didn't you translate that?" And I said, "You can't translate that. There is no equivalent. What do you mean by equivalent?" He didn't realize what an equivalent was and how necessary that was. Even Günter Grass didn't. So um, I can't blame anybody for not understanding what we're doing. Mm. But we, I, we should yeah. stand up and, and be counted and say what we're doing. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's, you know, all, it's altogether too likely that you will have somebody who will pass on a, a, de a text or a document uh, for a, just not quite a second opinion because you know, no, they don't want to pay, you know, double the money, as it were, um, you know, at least in, in my case, when I'm, I'm sort of charged with the task. Um, and, and so they get somebody to look at it who is perhaps even a native speaker, perhaps not. Um, and they say, oh, OK, well, I don't use that and oh, I'd never do that. And oh, this isn't the case and so on. And mm -hmm. I do remember one of my translations being criti criticized by a non-native speaker, but who had lived in, in the UK for 10 years. Um, and uh, you know, I got the feedback of so we, you, know, you never say this, you never say that, you never say that. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, the problem was that there was uh, the person disagreed with my choice of preposition in two or three places. I mean, OK, it's, it doesn't really matter. Um, but when, when I tried to explain this to my client, as it were, the client said, Zach, I don't care. I really don't care. Just, um, you know, I, I believe you're, you're right because we've used you for so many years. So but, you know, just to keep the client happy, just do this, just accept it. You know, um, yeah, just whatever. But there was one I, I said, so I, I refuse. I cannot because this is a purely grammatical thing. I cannot do what the client wants to do because it's wrong. It's grammatically incorrect. So I sent that back and then, you know, whether they changed it themselves or whether the client accepted that, OK, that particular grammar point uh, they would concede. I don't know. But I mean, it's very, as you say, it's very rare that we have the opportunity to defend our choices. So, I mean, you yes. had the wonderful chance to speak with Gunter Grass, which in itself, I guess, was quite an experience. Um, but generally speaking, we don't get that opportunity. That's true. That's true. Uh, how, what kind of a person was Gunter Grass, by the way? Was he very demanding? Uh, no, he was very, very um, helpful, 
we we were sitting um, during that uh, international pen conference on the outside. I was not a delegate at the time. Um, and he, as a uh, main speaker, was also not on the on the floor, so to speak. So um, he was sitting there happily and looked at me and said, do you have uh, headache pills? And of course, I went up to my room and brought him headache pills and a glass of water. He was very easygoing, very easygoing. Can, can you talk to, can you tell us a bit about him? Because uh, some people that listen to this perhaps won't know who Gunter Glass was. Well, he um, he got his Nobel Literary Prize in '99, I think, and we were in Moscow in 2000. So this was right after he had gotten his uh, international uh, acclaim, which he had already before that, but he, he got the prize, and he had been one of the most famous. Uh, writers in Germany uh, from basically 1950-55 onwards and we all read uh, the um, my brain my brain um, die Blechtrommel the tin drum and all his other, other books I there were some books I had hard time getting into and I dropped them again, and I didn't read them. I read uh, excerpts from it. But um, his writing is, he, he is uh, fabulous. Uh, in German, even the word fabulous is uh, used as er fabuliert. He cannot stop telling stories and going about uh, embellishing or, or uh not embellishing in terms of bettering them, but um, making them wider and deeper and more colorful and uh, more drastic. He is a storyteller. He's a storyteller of the greatest kind. Uh, he's also a, an artist. And um, in Moscow, as it turned out, he spent not a couple of days after the conference with uh, our Russian colleagues, and they later uh, told us that uh, every night they had to go dancing with him, dancing and drinking vodka. So uh, he, they loved him. Um, oh. They loved him before that. But uh, he was there and he was there present at the meeting all the time for one particular reason, because the Russian Penn Center, who was our host center, were under attack from all sides in Russia, that they were inviting our uh, liberal uh, people. The Penn community worldwide is relatively liberal and um, they needed help. And he was there. He knew that. And he was solidarisch. He was he, he stayed there to for for the uh, press to see him to uh, so that nothing could happen, and that I appreciated very much. As did your uh, Russian colleagues at the time, I imagine. Of course, it's, uh, it's, it's you know I I once had um, a student, um, and I've had many many students actually, most of them to be honest, who teach me perhaps as much as uh, I, I've taught them. But I, I had a student in particular, he. Um, he studied for six months um, and he couldn't study any longer um, the etymology of language. So he was uh, a, a scientist in, in Italy and as a sort of side course, he studied also the etymology of language. And he talked about how Latin, for example, left Rome and went on a journey in many cases, sometimes through France to Britain and then uh, hundreds of years later back again. Um, but when it came back, it had changed. Absolutely. 
And this concept for me at the time was just, it wasn't possible for me to understand. So I had to really think about it. And then, you know, I, I, he, he gave me a few examples, which I can't think of uh, at the moment. But, you know, wh when you talk about, for example, any kind of Latin based word and you have differences between perhaps the English meaning, the, the, the original Latin or the Italian meaning and the German meaning, it's because over the years uh, it has changed a little bit. And just, just sorry, yeah, do you want to say something about no, that? No, uh, particularly uh, through French. Um, the uh, Romans came along the Rhine. They went into Gaul, France, Belgium. Um, then they came to England in the, 11th in the 12th century um, with William the Conqueror and the court and all the noblemen spoke so-called Latin. It was what we would today call pigeon Latin. It was um, it, it it was the, the it had the changes already in there. So the changes came into the English language. They came into the French language. They also within uh, Italy, uh, because the Roman uh, the Romans that came back from England or France. Um, of course, spoke their pidgin English and brought it back. Um, I had to laugh when I first heard about it because my father uh, had school English and he didn't have that much of a knack for, for languages, but uh, he needed it desperately when he was in Japan for four years as uh, an engineer. So, a uh, what he learned in Japan was Pigeon English. And he came back with Pigeon English and thought it was English. And I was learning English and I was, you know, saying, that's not true, that's not right, that's not right. And he said, yeah, of course it is right. And then later somebody uh, explained to him that, you know, he, he realized as well that his English was not the British English or the American English. And the British English is different from the American English. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I, I will come back to one of the, re the reason why I talked about the the Latin thing. But just on, on the point there, I, another student of mine, again from Italy, um, she said to me uh, one day that she she bought a book at the airport uh, in at Heathrow Airport, um, and she said that she had tried time and time again to read it, but she couldn't understand a single word. And I found that remarkable because we were talking about a student of mine with whom I we'd, you know, read so many texts, it, it would be mm -hmm. impossible to have one sentence where no words were understood. It just wasn't possible. So she brought the book to me and it was written in Jamaican English. Yes. Uh, and it was, but it, I, I mean, I, I can, uh, completely imagine that there are lots of Jamaican authors who g can write in the kind of English which uh, you'd, any kind of school would pick up in, in the UK, for example. Um, but this particular book was essentially communicated in Jamaican English, street English that is spoken in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I understood it perfectly because I had um, you know, a number of friends who were from uh, originally from you know, Jamaica. I worked in a shop. Um, we used to. It was right next to the Notting Hill Carnival, um, and so there were lots of people who used to come in and communicate with me in Jamaican English. So I could understand it, but it was impossible for me to make somebody else understand it. You had to. Jamaican English is a language you have to experience. You have to right. watch the people speak it understand their facial expressions it is such a, a rich way of communicating but you really have any to kind feel. of creole language any mm. kind of creole language any kind where everywhere where um colonists brought the language to those who lived there or brought with them um at in in many cases slaves whom they indoctrinated with their language and the slaves or the, the uh, colonized uh, responded by using that language the way they wanted. It was also a way of resistance to this day. Mm. This is very true in Africa. It's fascinating though, isn't it? Though? Because I mean, so much 
you know, is it, you, we, I, I wouldn't have uh, associated that particularly with, you know, with the uh, the, the the more than tragic uh, history, um, you know, that uh, was forced upon uh, people from Africa. But you can see how lively the language is. It's amazing how lively it is. The rhythms. I mean, you talk about the rhythms, the breath, and so on. And you know, if somebody there can understand the, it, yeah. In in those languages, in most, in all those Creole languages, you hear the music. It's not it's just brilliant. rhythm. It's yeah, it's, it's music. It is absolutely. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I read, I tried to read it to uh, the student because I, you can't read it in a normal way. Mm -hmm. So I, I read it. The only way I could read it to my student was by pretending to be one of my friends. Yes. I had to read it in his voice yes. to, give, and, to give any sense. Yeah. And his gestures. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, but it was brilliant because I had never even considered the possibility that uh, in Jamaica there were written texts which were, you know, in this way. I just had never thought about it. I guess, I mean, there, why not? Every kind of spoken language must have a form which is then passed on somehow, if, if you know, in written form would be best, I guess. Think of our dialects. Think of the British uh, English dialect. Think of uh, the Gaelic uh, dialects or the Gaelics, uh, the Gaelic was, was a language, but they're now dialects of Gaelic and their dialects, you know, the Yorkshire dialect is different from, from London uh, lingo. Mm. Right? And um, if you put this in, in writing, it's difficult to read. Yeah, if you're not familiar with the language, yes, of course, yeah. it's, uh, it would be very difficult. I mean, I, I would say that these, I mean, you're right, though, Ian, because for, for me, the accents, I'm not sure that in, for example, Yorkshire English would be described as a dialect because because it's essentially the same language, but spoken differently. Um, but they have I, I their think, own terms. They have yes. their own terms. Yeah. Their own f uh, terms for food, for things that uh, belong to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is a dialect, yes. Mm, okay, so that because of the, the 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 regional basis, essentially, it's only yes. spoken in those areas. So that would yes. make it dialectical, I guess. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I, I remember yeah. uh, there's also an element of uh, development of language. Uh, when I was in England, I was 16. Um, I was taking English classes and uh, we were reading Chaucer in oh. the original. Oh, that must have been a challenge. I had no problem. It was so much closer to German than <laughs> modern English was <laughs> okay. that I could translate for my English friends what was written there. Mm. You know, that's that's another aspect of uh, uh, the development of language. Mm. English developed into English away from the Germanic language because of the input by the French, uh, William the Conqueror, um, uh, nobility language. You know, look, look at English. You have two words for most everything. You have a calf and a cow, ein Kalb und eine Kuh. You have veal and you have pork. Vo, epoch, comes the same thing in, in France. So the the upper language in the, the more, more stylish language in English is very much closer to the French and because of the Latin, uh, whereas the um, dual element of English is very easily explained, but nobody nobody does. Why doesn't anybody who teaches German uh, speak about what a Hamlet is? Ein kleines Heim. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. There are so many things that you can very easily not translate, but listen to and know what it is in German. And the other half of English, you can listen to it and you know what it is in, in French. I relearned French through English. That's fascinating because I relearned French through Italian. 
Yeah, right, right, <laughs> That's it. right. Yeah. And because um, I I knew French and, and Latin and and had Spanish, uh, I could very well uh, understand most everything in Italy. We were in Italy for half a year. Um, I I whenever I spoke Italian, it was. Uh, very funny because I spoke uh, Italian words with uh, Spanish grammar mm -hmm. because I didn't I didn't uh, know the Italian grammar. So you know, languages are something that are fascinating. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating. I mean, I, I do remember that I I read a few pages of Dante's Inferno in the uh, original language and I understood it and I thought that was okay. Um, but I once tried to read Milton's Paradise Lost, <laughs> and I have to say, I was lost. Um, did you struggle with that? I mean, have you read it? Uh, I've read parts of it. Okay. Um, I was, uh, but I was too much in, into German uh, uh, early Romanticism to really get into English Romanticism. Wordsworth was mm. one that I read more closely. Mm. Um, no, there, there are many, uh, I read many plays of the 14th, 15th, 16th century. No, 14th, there, there are no plays yet. Um, but there I had problems sometimes because I didn't know the references. I didn't know where it came from. I didn't know the everyday life of those times. And this is what... Uh, I meant with you have to transport also the milieu and the uh, society of the time. When you translate, for instance, a novel, you can't, can't just, uh, you know, translate the words. It's impossible. But then you, you also mentioned, so because we started on the on the, the path of poetry so you know it would be unfair to to to, to you know not go further into it because poetry is a big part of what you translated and, and, and you you referenced before saying uh, with regards to rhyme uh, and and the like um, yeah how hard is it for you to translate poetry and to at the same time communicate uh, not only the intention but the the emotion of those intentions. It, it depends how far I get into the poet, in the poetry, how much I like it. Uh, there's one little poem. Uh, I have the German and the my English translation right here. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with the uh, German. Mm -hmm. It's for Paul Klee, for the, uh, for the uh, painter. Die Zwitschermaschine, which is a painting of his. Eine kleine blaue Maschine ohne Rad, eigentlich nur eine Kurbel und etwas Draht. Zwei Lärchen und eine Amsel sitzen darauf und die Kurbel hat ein Radieschen als Knauf. Man braucht nur ein bisschen Drehen und Gesang, verwandelt das traurige Leben in Überschwang. That's the original. Mm. It took me a long time to translate that. The Twitter Machine for Paul Clay. Just a little light blue contraption, no attire, actually only a handle on bits of wire. A lark and a single blackbird resting on top and a reddish serving the handle as knob. One only need turn it lightly and at once a song is transforming life's sadness into exuberance. Can you see how, how difficult that was? And, and the, the the rhythm is different, um, completely different. I, I noticed it, but as, as being different. But uh, I mean, it but is, wonderful. It, it had, I had to uh, I had to adapt it to the English language. This is not uh, this is not rhymed. Mm. There's no rhyme, and with free verse, you can uh, you cannot imitate German because German the ending of of lines are usually um, with a so-called so uh, feminine, uh, feminine uh, ending, which mm. means an unstressed ending. Uh, Radieschen. Mm. Um, 
you have you can imitate that with contraption yes but um leben uh you cannot do it with uh amsel for instance you a blackbird the stress is on both syllables so you have to change um the the stresses but in in the the tonality in itself has to be has to be all right has to be uh, uh, conceivable mm. you know you cannot even there you like you cannot translate word from word you cannot translate a form to form you cannot translate rhyme to rhyme you cannot translate tonality to tonality nor rhythm to rhythm you have to use the rhythm that is um, predominant in the language in the target language yeah i mean it, it is fascinating i don't know if uh, you know how many people who lis listening to this will you know have translated or attempted to translate because there is there is such a it is such a challenge you do need you know trial and error trial and error and you know i think i mean how many times for example were you okay you studied these um, these elements so therefore you had i imagine very effective guidance um but i mean how many times for example were you you know essentially told um you know these are the lines you have to follow because otherwise you 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 will just be lost in the detail or, or lost even you become a, a, a prisoner uh, to the uh, the original author's uh, or the original poet's thoughts. Um, I I learned that by reading uh, other uh, translations and some were good and some were bad and I followed the I analyzed the good ones and I followed <laughs> their uh, method as far as I could. And there were times when I uh, invented my own methods to satisfy my feeling what was right. You cannot uh, learn that. You can mm. you you cannot teach it. Can, uh, same way you cannot teach uh, people to write poems. You can let them write poems and see what what kind of uh, type of poems they can come up with um, and the more poems they read the better their own poetry will become but uh, you cannot make a poet you cannot make a translator uh, that's really interesting i mean okay you know i'm sure that uh, there's a lot of translation software out there which you know in the main it, it can be very helpful of course you can the, the, especially the, the the ones that are sort of really well developed um but for example there are artificial intelligence uh practices where they they get a uh, a program to write poetry or to write a novel um and uh, from from what you say in, in your opinion do you think that's possible or do you think that's not possible no no okay that may be possible uh, for maybe a paragraph or maybe a sentence, but not for a whole novel and not for a whole poem. And what, what, what would you put your finger on as being the main reason for, for, for that? What, what, what is it about? Uh, as, I, internet, uh, in, um, um, IT cannot think, cannot, has no emotions. And poetry is emotions and not just feelings, but active emotions, um, not just the, the passive feeling, but active emotions. And it is um, trying to grasp the essence of what you're trying to say. This is why I like short poems more than I do like the long ones. Because the shorter they are, the more they have to work at saying exactly what they mean. And at the same time, leaving us uh, room for association, our own associations, our own feelings, our own response to the topic that we see in there. Because a poem is always something that doesn't belong to you anymore once it's written. Mm. 
you know. Um, well, I, I grew up with the, sort of quite grew up with the, uh, a movie which my, my mum used to love with, uh, with, the, with Natalie Wood, and it was Splendour in the Grass. Was that not to Wordsworth? Do you remember? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I, 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 yeah, I think um, it was a very, very emotional uh, poem as well, unless I'm mistaken. Um, talking about also regret and such. Um, I mean, so many different things, so many different factors involved. And and the movie, if, I don't know if anybody ever has a chance to watch this movie with Natalie Wood, it's stunning. Um, but they don't make these kinds of uh, movies, at least not the, the sort of the big budget movies where there is such a strong influence of poetry. It's, it's a shame. That's a sh that's, it's true and it's a shame. And uh, the uh, this particular one, I th I must have seen it at one point, but it kind of fades faded into the background. Um, what I found so uh, fascinating with Wordsworth was with all the emotion and all the um, the the intricate feeling of nature. There was a philosophy behind it, and a philosophy of life, a philosophy of history, and a philosophy of uh, being, and uh, the, the metaphysical and the physical. And uh, this is this is something that uh, is has been divorced in terms of because it's so so difficult to keep uh, together the the holistic kind of poetry uh, that um, I do miss that as well I do miss that of the poetry and the, and and what has what one can make with the on on the basis of the poetry I mean whether it's film or whether it's uh, music or whether it's uh, a radio play or whatever. Yeah, I mean, looking at this, um, I mean, this particular poem of Spender in the Grass, uh, I mean, it's, it's fabulous, uh, the words. I mean, just to look at this one. Um, what though the radiance, which was once so bright, be now forever taken from my sight, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. I mean, mm -hmm. as you said, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the philosophy, um, you know, and the, the natural reference there, the, the depth to the sentiment. He's uh, dealing with time and space mm. and personality and feeling and love, yeah. communication. Yeah, I mean, it's there's such depth to you know to, to this. I mean, it's it, it you know it is not for you know without its 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 value that that you know people can uh, completely dedicate themselves to, to poetry because there's you know there is an efficiency as well, but it's not quite efficient because efficiency sounds too scientific. You know, people just have a way of writing you know, these kinds of. Uh, of verses, and it's wonderful. You leave everything aside that does not need to be said, and you say everything that includes what you are not saying. <laughs> that, that's what makes poetry so so intricate and so so difficult and so wonderful, I think. Yeah, I'm so happy we're recording this because I'm going to have to play it back what you just said and think about it many, many times uh, before it actually gets through uh, uh, my membrane. Um, yeah, earlier on, you also said that you wanted to read a paragraph of, uh, I think it was an essay that you had uh, translated or, or? No, that I'd written yes, in you'd written. London uh, yeah. 40 years ago. 
Yes, yes, yes. I think that would be a wonderful place to, you know, to, to, to end the, this session because we've already gone beyond, way beyond the hour mark. So, um, we please, can also yes. do that some other time. Oh no, no, please, please. You've, you've. Um, I'm sitting here with bated breath, waiting for this paragraph to be read. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's Where okay. Did I put it. At the root of the term translation lies the Latin translatus, the past participle of the verb transfere. May we not therefore describe a translation as an accomplishment achieved at the conclusion of a process? During this process, a substance is, substance is transferred from one place to another, while at the same time undergoing a material change. Our material is the word. Our substance is meaning, or if you wish, our vehicle is language, the cargo is information, culture, and art. That was the image I came up with to explain what translation was. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I, I can imagine you must have been a treasure to the to your professors and the people that worked with you because you had such a way and uh, you know from such a young age to you know to talk about these things um if, if they let me if they let me <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i would i would love to do like um you know to to refer to perhaps you know in one of our sessions um you know of some of the the best things that you learned and some of the you know, you know perhaps give give some of your you know favorite tips as it were because i mean you've done this with speed reading you you um you know, gave a few fascinating tips on how to get through so much so many uh pages uh while reading for your degrees but um yeah maybe we can do something like that and you can you know give us a few of your you know your tips um but also definitely your your insight it's it's you know there's a wealth of wisdom uh, and information there. It's it's not wisdom. It it was. Um, I I was in a surrounding which was was uh, trembling with ideas, and I just picked up those that I thought pertained to what I tried to do and was trying to do, and I had never wanted to be a teacher. And at the university, I love teaching because I could try not to stand there and lecture, but I could get them to lecture to me. And you said something very important today. You learn more from your students than your students learn from you. And this is the exact way I felt. I still feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's um yeah. I, I think any kind of relationship, it's it's a two way street. Um, and you know, if anybody believes that they're in a situation where it's one way, um, then they need to reassess either their own uh, processes, or the the complete nature of the relationship. So, and I think student and teacher, um, co students, co teachers, any kind of relationship, friends, um. There has to be a, it's a two way street. There has to be an exchange. Absolutely. And it, there is a certain effort that is necessary to keep this up in friendship, in love, in teaching, in, in what have you in writing. You can't just sit back and say, oh, I've done my stuff. And that's the danger of old age, I must say. This is why I'm so happy. I cannot sit back and say I've done my my share. I still have to contribute, do something. So you're forcing me to be alive still. <laughs> that is a very very interesting way of terming it. Um, you should you should talk to to uh, a lot of people that I grew up with. They sit back and they say, "Oh, wonderful." Now let the others think. Now let the others work. Um, now uh, we we have our we have our uh, old age corner, and we can simply sit back and dream away the rest of our life. 
Karin, thank you very much once again. Um, I'm eternally grateful for your patience and um, your your thoughts, your 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 wisdom, even though you don't consider it to be wisdom. Um, but you know, just the the way that you you look at things, you analyze things, uh, it's always so educational for me. So thank you very much once again. Thank you too. It's it cuts both ways. <laughs> It I'm really so happy. Does. I'm so happy it does. It yes. really does. Thank you. Yeah. And my love to your family. And oh my.